Our next speaker is Professor Robert Greenler from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and his topic is the origins of multiple bands in the infrared spectra of CO adsorbed on metal surfaces. Bob. This does stir up some memories uh, uh, coming back, and hearing Keith's uh, comments uh, makes me remember that the Gordon Conference, which you say was 64, uh, in which Keith essentially invited everyone in the world who had published a paper on the infrared uh, investigation of that sort of molecules, and most of them came. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, uh, how many of you here were at that Gordon Conference in 64? Uh, Two, three, four, five, six, yeah, I see. Not quite as uh, impressive a turnout as Woodstock, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, quite interesting. Uh, I had uh, uh, done, I, I come from a physics background. I had done my uh, graduate research on something entirely different and afterwards decided that there was a fruitful area here to, to which to apply infrared spectroscopy, which I knew a little bit about. Uh, I developed this essentially by myself, uh, tried to teach myself something about this, and when I got to this Gordon conference, I talked a little bit about the alcohol work that Steve, uh, that uh, Keith mentioned, the alcohols on aluminum, and I remember the question, which may have been Keith's, I don't know who answered it, saying, everyone knows that uh, uh, alumina uh, dehydrates alcohols, and according to your work, it looks like it should dehydrogenate it. Why is that? Uh, and I remember shrugging my shoulders and saying, well, that's the way the spectra, I, I interpret the spectra, and I felt like I was a, a stupid physicist standing naked in front of this group of chemists. Now, uh, I've never quite gotten over that feeling. <laughs> uh, but as you see, I continue to do it uh, and to risk and do the best I can in uh, uh, talking to chemists. Uh, let, me, uh, let me introduce my co-author, uh, Kurt Brandt, uh, who is the source of a number of the insights that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and what I'm going to do is discuss a situation where we adsorb one kind of simple molecule on a metal surface, CO, uh, and look at a multiplicity of bands which come all from the CO stretching vibration. And what I'm going to do is to try to give you some physical insight into the source of those bands. That is, I'm going to try to give you our physical interpretation uh, rather than the evidence, rather than the evidence for it. Uh, first, the big picture. You put uh, a CO molecule onto a metal surface, and in a sense now you have an entity, a molecule which includes the surface. And what we tend to call the CO stretching vibration really is a normal mode of this surface, a normal mode of vibration of this surface. And the frequency of that normal mode, which for convenience we call CO stretching, really involves the whole entity. Uh, and so if you change another part of the entity, you change the CO stretching vibration. And so uh, the first picture uh, is one which uh, appropriately uh, uh, dates to the, the uh, paper which uh, started all of this. And uh, you see some bands which come from putting a CO molecule linearly bonded to a surface atom. We see some other uh, entities or other bands that come from CO molecules bridge bonded to two and some others that result from uh, bonding to three or more. Now, something that I'm going to emphasize as I discover, discuss several of these effects is the magnitudes of the differences. D 
these three kinds of bonding situations give bands in positions that differ by about 100 weight numbers, 100 reciprocal centimeters. And that's uh, going to be significant in some of the other things that I'm going to discuss. From now on, I'm going to talk about the situation where you get several or a few infrared bands, all of which come from what we'll call the CO stretching vibration, uh, linearly bonded to a surface metal atom. Now, most of us who have been in this business a while have, uh, have uh, succumbed to the temptation to say, ah, you see three bands and they're three different crystal sites, this face, that face, an edge, uh, or whatever. And most of us have succumbed to that and gotten it wrong. Uh, so one of the uh, objects of my talk today is to try to convince you that in general that's not a viable interpretation and you have to, you have to look elsewhere uh, to explain these multiple bands. Let me consider the, the crystal site effect first. I'm going to treat uh, a, a few different effects. Uh, for platinum, and presumably for other uh, metals, uh, we find that the significant feature, the band position, when you adsorb linearly to a metal atom, is the coordination number of that metal atom in the surface. For instance, if you look at uh, uh, one of these uh, atoms on the step edge, you see that it's surrounded in that layer by four atoms and sits on three below, so it has a coordination number of seven. And essentially, the, the vibration frequency of the adsorbed molecule in that atom is determined by that coordination number of seven. And in fact, if you compare that then uh, with uh, uh, the atom in an edge of a small particle, which also has a coordination number of seven, they both have essentially the same uh, frequency, determined by that coordination number. Uh, another similar example, if you have a, a kinked step surface where you have a coordination number of six, uh, you can have a similar site for adsorption and a, si a similar CO vibration frequency as if you're in the corner uh, of a particle as I showed there. Next, let me consider the uh, coupling between uh, two atoms adsorbed uh, nearby, or, or two molecules adsorbed nearby. If you have two oscillators which couple to each other, this is generally true in any coupled system of oscillators, you have a system now, and an appropriate way to look at that system is to consider its normal modes. You have one normal mode where these two oscillators are uh, oscillating in phase, and another one where they're oscillating out of phase. Uh, in the molecular case, this in phase system has a higher frequency than the outer phase. Uh, if you have n oscillators, you get n normal modes. Uh, So let me show you some uh, simple models. Here n is equal to 5, and I show you 5 oscillators, and, and the numbers are picked to represent uh, CO atoms on a platinum uh, surface. <clears throat> and you see there are 5 normal vibrations five normal modes, and we plotted them out here, and the, the length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the motion of that uh, oscillator. So there's a couple things to see here. Uh, uh, this, this highest frequency mode has everything oscillating in phase. Uh, to see the strength of the infrared band produced by this mode, you want to look at the 
magnitude of the dipole that's uh, uh, the dipole that's oscillating uh, with this mode. And you see everything oscillating in phase here uh, gives a big, uh, a big uh, dipole oscillation and hence a big infrared intensity. The second mode has some, some of the CO molecules stretching and others contracting. The net dipole change accompanying that mode of oscillation is zero. And the infrared intensity is zero. That is, you can't, iso you can't excite a vibration uh, with an electric field where there's no change in the, uh, in the uh, oscillating, in the dipole moment that goes along with that uh, vibration. So in fact, you see that uh, where this has an intensity of one, uh, the maximum intensity of the others is 5% of that. So essentially, you might say, with this, all you would see is one band, and it would be shifted up about 10 uh, reciprocal centimeters from uh, the isolated uh, molecule. And in fact, here we see how it shifts as you increase the length of the chain, and the shift is the order of 10 reciprocal centimeters when you have a few atoms together. Now we could do the same thing with a two-dimensional array, which I show here. Uh, and again, you see the highest frequency mode is the one where everything is uh, vibrating in phase. Uh, and uh, the different modes vary by about 10 uh, reciprocal centimeters. Uh, but this is the only one that has any appreciable intensity. The highest, the, the next one that's highest has 4% of that. And you see that when you talk about the number of atoms here, uh, that the shift from coupling is greater because uh, particular molecule has uh, more nearest neighbors when you're packed in a two-dimensional array than when you're spread in one dimension. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the shift, the magnitudes of the shifts. As we go from one mode to the other, uh, the shifts vary, the frequencies, wave numbers vary by five or ten wave numbers, <coughs> and the kind of shifts that you get for a few molecules put together is the order of ten or 20 wave numbers. I've shown you cases and said in each one of these cases I show, and I could show you many more where this is also true, uh, that the only significant intensity, infrared uh, absorption, is uh, connected with the in-phase vibration. And so you might say, so why am I telling you all this stuff about the other vibrations which uh, don't contribute anything to the infrared absorption? And the answer is, okay, sometimes they do. Uh, for instance, let me give you one example. Suppose you uh, absorb these molecules around a small particle. The highest frequency mode is the one where they're all oscillating in phase. That is to say, all the molecules are stretching at the same time. And you look at that, the net dipole change in this case, where you've wrapped the chain around a molecule, the net dipole change is zero. And so in that case, you won't see that mode. The second mode, about 10 wave numbers down, is this one where the ones on top are stretching, where the ones on the bottom are contracting, and it means they're all doing this together. And that's the mode where most of the intensity is. So there's a case where sometimes you may have one mode oscillating and sometimes another mode, and the difference is about 10 wave numbers. So I've been giving, I've given you three examples uh, of the ways in which a number of identical molecules uh, adsorb so they can interact with each other uh, form a coupled system. Now, what I have said, and I want to emphasize again, 
I think, a significant and a fundamental way to look at, at this system is to look at it as a system which has a number of normal modes. And each of the absorption bands, the infrared that you get from that system, is one of the normal modes of that coupled system. Uh, all right, you know to get strong coupling, you need to have the frequencies of oscillators fairly close together. For instance, if you park a linearly bonded CO next to a bridge bonded CO so that their, uh, their wave numbers uh, uh, differ by uh, 100 reciprocal centimeters, let's say, there's a system and it has two normal modes uh, where they vibrate in phase and out of phase. But you'll find that in this case, one uh, in one of those uh, modes, uh, the frequency is almost the same as one of the molecules, and the other one is not participating much in that mode. And in the other mode, the frequency is essentially the mode of the independent uh, other molecule, and this one is not participating much in that mode. So if their frequencies are far apart, they don't interact very much. Now, here's, here's an important point of what I'm trying to develop today, uh, is that a number of these effects that I've showed you all produce shifts of the order of 10 wave numbers. And so you can get groups of one kind of molecule coupling up uh, and shifting their fre frequency until they can couple with a different kind of vibration. Now, I, uh, rather than try to make that clearer in words, let me, uh, let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. This is a hypothetical example. Uh, don't take it uh, too seriously, though I will relate it to something I'll show you later. Uh, suppose this is uh, a terrace in a step surface, uh, in a 100 surface, and uh, here's the edge of the terrace. Uh, if we adsorb a CO molecule on the terrace, or some that are widely separated, they'll have a frequency of about 2077, an isolated terrace, uh, molecule in the isolated terrace. If I adsorb a molecule on the step, which has a different coordination number, the isolated frequency is about 2067. If I populate that whole uh, step edge with a, a linear array, the linear array will, the interaction will raise that in phase mode, which I showed you, up to about uh, 2077. So now with that coupling, this system has the same frequency as these isolated terrace atoms, and so they will strongly couple together. And there'll be a strong interaction. Now, let me put that in normal mode language. I would say that there should be a strong normal mode, which consists of all of these molecules vibrating in phase together, uh, producing a strong infrared band. So I'm going to show you two examples uh, of systems where I think we can get some intuitive understanding by this kind of, uh, uh, of shifting in color. Uh, we've looked at CO on platinum particles, uh, two different samples uh, which have different uh, mean particle sizes. There's a distribution, but the mean of uh, one of these is 11 and the other is uh, 39 angstroms. And when you adsorb CO on those two uh, different samples, you get very different spectra. These are experimental spectra.
first let me try to see if we can make some sense out of the spectrum for the smaller uh, part of it. Now here, I have a table up here in which I show the wave number of an isolated adsorbed molecule. And now this, I, I want to emphasize this, this all comes from uh, analysis of extended single crystal data with the reflection absorption technique. Uh, not not uh, uh, our work, but uh, work from the literature. And you see, depending on the coordination number, you get different uh, wave number, uh, and varying linearly with coordination number with steps of uh, 10 reciprocal centimeters. So we're going to apply this to the small particle, and our model particle is one 12 angstroms in diameter, which has a very nice, uh, uh, very nice shape. In fact, most of the atoms in that molecule are corner atoms. If I cover that molecule with, or that uh, little crystal with uh, CO molecules spaced uh, square root of three times a, a platinum diameter apart, uh, you can get 12 molecules on it, all of which are on the corners. So this is what I understand down here or I should say we understand down here. This is our uh, calculated spectra, and we only understand things up here insofar as we can predict them from what we calculate. So what we've done is calculate normal modes for different arrangements. When we get a normal mode uh, with a certain intensity, we represent it by a Lorentzian band with a bandwidth of, uh, I believe, 14 reciprocal centimeters. Uh, which to match our spectra, I think there's some evidence that we have a, something like a 12 reciprocal centimeter uh, bandwidth plus another two uh, instrumental uh, contribution. When we put six CO atoms on here, on the corners, we're starting off with something 2057. I mean, we get that from the, the, the extended surface data. Uh, coupling takes that up about 10 reciprocal centimeters. I mean, and so we have something, say, which extends over, uh, you know, some of each of two centimeters. And the second mode, we're not looking at the all in phase mode. The second mode down drops that back another, to, uh, another 10 reciprocal centimeters. And so we end up with this, with a mode here at about 2060, which is that band right there. Now, if you have the same bunch of molecules spread over two, let's think of spread over two hemispheres, there is another mode. It's going to be weaker. Uh, I think I said that wrong. Uh, the, the higher mode is the in phase mode. That, the strong mode here is the one where those in the upper hemisphere are going up and those in the lower hemisphere are also going up. Uh, that is, uh, some of them are out of phase with the others. That's the strongest mode, and that's the one at 2060. So let, let me say that again. We've, take, we've started off with something at about 2057. We've, by coupling, we've shifted it up about 10 reciprocal centimeters. Since we've not used the high mode, but the second one, we dropped it back down 10 reciprocal centimeters, and we end up at about the same uh, position we started there, it's actually about 26. The in phase mode, when you don't have a complete layer, is there, weaker. It's been shifted up by the coupling, but not, but we're, uh, but not down because we're still in that highest mode. And so that gives a band here. And of course, uh, the interest in that is because uh, it looks like the spectrum here for particular coverage, uh, the experimental spectrum. If we put 12 molecules on there, saturate the surface, this second mode shifts up a few reciprocal centimeters, and the first mode now disappears. That is, where everything is in phase, stretching, no dipole moment, and the experimental spectra hasn't quite disappeared, 
And that's not surprising because if instead of 12 you put 11 or 13, you still get it. If your particles are a little bit asymmetric, you'll still get a trace of what, in the perfect case, would be a symmetric vibration with no dipole change. So I think we understand uh, something about where those bands come from. If we look at the bigger particle, and again, we're starting off with data which comes not from the small particles that we're trying to interpret, but it comes from the extended single crystal data. Uh, if we look at the case where we have 13 atoms, 13 molecules placed on here, and what we did was start putting them around the corner and expanded them out into the faces. Uh, and at, uh, 13 molecules here is our, our placement, you see, which uh, is represented down here. Uh, this is going to be the, mo the model spectrum, the spectrum that we're going to deduce from this. For those 13 molecules, if we look at the normal modes of them, there are three normal modes that dominate everything. The ones I've shown you here, they have 85% of all the intensity, the rest divided up between a lot of minor modes. The one that's uh, the lowest frequency is nothing much is participating except these three isolated uh, molecules, which you see are edge, <coughs> are molecules at sort of edge sites whose frequency on the extended single crystals are 2067. They're far enough away in this uh, normal mode that uh, they don't couple, and the, the frequency of that normal mode is 2067. The next mode here is one where these three molecules, which are also on edges, but they're in a little cluster, coupled tightly, which will raise their frequency from 2067 uh, about 10 reciprocal centimeters, let's say to 2077, which then puts it the same as the frequency of an atom in a 111 phase, namely that one. Now this is similar to the example I showed you. So that these all couple together and with the addition to the party of this uh, 100 uh, molecule uh, pushes the frequency to about 2080. The highest mode is one where you have strings of atoms or molecules here, which you see are on 111 sites, which start at 2087. Uh, we get shifted up by uh, somewhat by their, by their coupling. But you also have some contribution from these uh, uh, edge uh, molecules on edge sites tightly coupled, which has shifted them up as we've seen to about 2077. And so all of these couple together and give a frequency at about 2090. Now, I mean, we've continued the, uh, to expand and you see we get uh, uh, these uh, uh, model spectra which look almost embarrassingly similar to the experimental spectra. <clears throat> the point that I make here is there are three bands and three main sites and you get it wrong if you say one band for each site. This band comes from isolated uh, molecules on isolated edge atoms. This one comes from uh, molecules closely coupled edge atoms plus uh, one in a 100 position that are oscillating together. And this one is a combination of one one molecules on 111 sites plus tightly coupled edge, edge sites. The normal mode description tells us this, uh, and insofar as we can reproduce these, we know what these bands come from. So where do we go with this? Uh, I think probably it was about 25 years ago when Keith Hall started to complain uh, that you physicists uh, 
are still working with CO, when is it that you're going to start working on some interesting molecule? Uh, well, Keith, the emphasis here is not on the CO, but the emphasis here is on the surface. Uh, if we can interpret uh, absorption on these small, the absorption the infrared spectra on these small particles by saying, uh, by interpreting these bands in the, the way I've uh, talked about it, it would see that we're seeing that we're well on our way to being able to take the spectra from a dispersed CO adsorbed on a dispersed metal and tell you something about the number and kinds of sites on the metal and the size of single uh, crystal facets. And the casual observer who comes from a background not of chemistry might think that that, in, that kind of a description of what the surface consists of, sites, patches, correlated with uh, the results of different catalyst preparations and the corresponding different catalyst actions, a casual observer might think that that could be useful information. Thank you. I think we take time. Yeah, one quick question, and that's it. The particular array of CO that you use is this very interesting uh, triangular array. I think it was centered on an apex of the platinum crystal. Yes. And of course, the calculated spectra and the uh, theoretical spectra, or the experimental spectra, agree. Do you believe then that that type of absorption, avoiding the faces of that crystal, is likely to be the real way that the CO kills the site? Sure. So yes. And yeah. And 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 uh, Why would that be? well, I mean, we're led to that from the work on the step crystals, <coughs> where first you adsorb along the the edges rather than on the faces, and after you essentially saturate the edges, then you start adsorbing on the terraces. S similar, uh, uh, similar behavior. Yeah. This, this is an extremely interesting.